Hey everyone, welcome to CIS 137, class 13. I'm going to try to make classes a little bit shorter if I can, so I'm kind of not a little bit. Uh, so this, today we're not going to have a quote. I'm just going to jump right into the 20s. So if you missed the quote, let me know. But if you don't, yeah, I'm not going to have uh, I'm going to try to move things along a little faster. All right, so this, this class we're going to go over the a .env file and template strings or template literals. So they're called in JavaScript. Uh, then we're going to go over responsive web design and how to do responsive web design with CSS frameworks. And a uh, framework in particular we're going to work with named Bulma. All right, so let's jump right in. So when you're working on a software uh, application, there are several environments that you're going to have to work with in a professional environment. Now these environments are basically uh, different servers or machines that your code is going to run on. Uh, and this is all to support the software development lifecycle. So the first environment you'll see here is the development environment. And that is uh, it could be one or two things. It could be your local development machine, or there could be a server that is the development server that uh, several developers will share. Uh, and then next, after a uh, after you work on something in development, generally once it's in a good state, once you complete a feature, it would go uh, the software application that piece that actual set of code will go into QA or testing environment. And that's where QA testers can come in and really hit your code hard and iron out any bugs at that point. Next, you may have an environment named uh, user acceptance testing or staging, depending on uh, the project or who you're working with. At this point, you get the product in front of actual, you know, test users and and hammer out even more bugs. But it's already been past QA, so a lot of the bugs should be gone by this point. Uh, so it's just a, a matter of the actual users uh, telling you that the features are working as expected. Then I. Uh, Again, depending on the company, they may skip this step or they may, uh, you know, they could have any number of these environments. Uh, then you'd have pre-production slash maintenance. Now, this is code that's ready to go for production. Uh, and it might just be, you know, a beta test away or, uh, or this might actually be a mirror production. It's a... Uh, really up to the company or the the project. Once it passes that, the application will move into production. And that will be the actual site that everyone will see. Uh, by here, the bugs should be gone. And now, when you represent these environments in your code, generally, uh, they are all separate branches in Git. So there'll be a development branch, there'll be a QA branch, a UAT branch, uh, a staging branch or maintenance branch, and then a production branch. Now, as you push to those branches, uh, we'll talk about this later, but there could be uh, a continuous integration so that when you push to the branch, it'll automatically get pushed to whatever server is serving each of these environments. Now, how's that tie into what we're talking about with .env files? So each each server environment could have its own .env file. Now, these .env files are not meant to be shared. They're really just values that are local to that environment. So you could have, you know, a development API key for your local development machine, but then on production, you may have purchased uh, a license that gives you, you know, 10,000 requests per second or something like that. That license would only exist in the env file 
on the production machine. So that way you're not, you know, hammering away at your, at your license on a development machine. So these .env files should be separate for each environment. So to keep them separate, you should add the .env file to the .gitignore file. Now, anything inside the gitignore file will not be checked into GitHub. And if, if you followed the directions when we talked about gitignore in the past, then uh, you could use gitignore.io and see uh, React. No, we'll do node. You can use gitignore.io to see that it actually does ignore the .env file. So right here, so come .env, so .env, uh, .env environment variables file is part of the uh, .gitignore generated by gitignore.io. Create React app, however, does not ignore the .env file by default. So I, I start up a, a create React app just fresh right before this class to show you. So if you've seen this .get ignore file, all they have is uh, they do have .env.local. They have the, the specific environment files for each environment, uh, which we're not going over right now. But just having a regular .env file is not in the gitignore. So if we want to add that .env file, we could either you know just add it here, or we could take what's from uh, the gitignore.io uh, generated code. So we have Node. We could add Windows. Add Mac, OS 10, and oh, there's one more we want to put in there. So Node, OS 10, Windows, and WebStorm. If we do that, we could use the file generated here. Copy it. We can paste it in here. And that'll give us a good uh, get ignore file. Now our .env file is going to basically be a, a key value mapping, which means there's going to be some indicator on the left, kind of like a variable, and then an equal sign, and then the value on the right. Now, if you want the variable to actually be picked up by React, it needs to start with react app, react underscore app underscore. Then inside your code, inside the JavaScript, you can access the values using process.env. So for example, if you had a react app API key inside of your .env file, you would just access it with process.env react app API key. So let's, let's do an example of that. So we're going to add our .env file. Oh, and I had one more piece of information back here. So if you already checked in your uh, .env file, then after you add it to the .gitignore file, you'll have to run this code to remove the existing .env file from your cache. And even if you, you know, if it doesn't exist, that's fine. You could even run it straight from the terminal in WebStorm would be best because it has to be in the, the same directory as the .env file, uh, which WebStorm will automatically do with this terminal once it pops up. Uh, but then you can just run that git rm uh, .env dash dash cached. Make sure you do two hyphens there. And 
and I don't even have Git in it in here, so let's let's do that. The dot env file not checked in, it's grayed out. But if we ran, if you copy and paste directly from the the slide, unfortunately, it gets rid of that extra hyphen you have here. There you go. Fatal prospect dot env did not match any files. So we don't have to worry about that. It's not kind of, uh, it's not actually checked in. Okay, so let's add this React App API key. Zoom in a little bit. And we're just gonna equal sign, and we're gonna put the value straight in. We do not need to put quotes around these values, even if they're strings. So we could have, you know, Something like this. Any values in here, any kind of configuration values that you would have uh, for globally for your project would be in here. Let's switch the language to React. Okay, JSX. Um, so now we want to use our process env uh, value is you process dot env dot react app api key i showed you all this last class but i'm going to expand upon it a little bit Now we see our, yeah, I actually, yeah, I added a dollar sign in front of it. Let's get rid of that dollar sign. So it's coming later. So here's our value, x123y929a. So let me get rid of this. And we got rid of the dollar sign here. And that matches our x123y929a in in the .env file, and we could have more values in there, .env, .env file, something like this. And then we could use that color. See if I can get it to work correctly. I'm gonna go over this, these templated strings in a second. Ah, oh, I can't get it to work. Wow. Okay. I'm trying not to. Got this to work before. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. So I'm doing something wrong there. <clears throat> and if you have an idea of what it is, you know, post it in Slack and you'll get bonus points. If you can get this to work. But anyways, let's move on from it. I don't want to waste too much. Oh, I know what it is. So whenever you make changes to your .env file, they're not going to get picked up automatically during uh, the TR and start. You, you actually have to restart your project whenever uh, you make changes to the .env file and you want them to be picked up. So uh, I set the color to green by you know having the color in the .env file. If I change this value, it's not going to be picked up by uh, the web app unless I you know, shut it down. You know, press Control C and then do yarn start again. 
That's an important note. So now we have template literals. So here you can embed the value uh, for, from React app or from the, that env file or any JavaScript value directly into a string. So the idea here is, you know, instead of the building the string with uh, by concatenating strings together, you would have a, a templated literal which would have placeholders for all your values. And in fact, in JavaScript, which is neat, is that that placeholder can be any valid JavaScript expression. So that means you could call a function in there, you could have a variable, you could you know do some math in there, uh, and it'll evaluate whatever the JavaScript is, and it'll display it inside the string. So for example, if we wanted to add the API key to the end of a URL, which would be required for your project, then we could use a templated string like so. So note that uh, instead of using quotes for the templated string, you use the back tick. And the back tick is at the, probably the top left of your keyboard above the tab key. You'll see that 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 swoosh looking shape, <laughs> best way to explain it, is the tilde. And underneath of that is the back tick, that little uh, apostrophe looking thing, a backwards apostrophe. So we could you know, create a separate variable, or we could you know, embed this directly in somewhere. Uh, for example, in um, inside of our request.get, we could have something like a backtick and our URL, whatever the URL is. And and then whatever path it has, and then you know whatever query string parameters it needs. So I think it needs something like this. I'm not looking it up exactly because I want you guys to do that. And and we can put our our key directly into here. So to to indicate the the placeholder, we would use a dollar sign, the curly brace. And then WebStorm automatically puts the closing curly brace in, and we put an expression in there. And the expression would be process.env.react app API key. This request doc is not going to work because I don't have uh, Zebra agent uh, in this project. So we're just going to assign this to a variable. And we're going to display that URL in a paragraph right here. It's very similar to how we are injecting JavaScript into the JSX. You know, how we have these expressions surrounded by curly braces. But the difference is that we also need this dollar sign inside the template string. So going back and forth, you know, you see me putting dollar signs in here all the time. That's totally because I'm going back and forth between these two, uh, these two ideas here. So injecting JavaScript inside of JSX, just curly braces. Injecting uh, a JavaScript expression inside of a string, you know, starts with the dollar sign, then curly braces. So here, uh, in this color, we have a templated string. I think we could get away with just putting this though. All right, so now we see our URL right here, and it added the app key to the end of it. So if you want to look at more into template literals, you can check out this resource. Uh, and by the way, template literals are new in ES6. So that's ECMAScript 6 or ECMAScript 2015. Uh, but you can use them, and they'll work in older browsers by using a 
transpiler, which is automatically included in Create React App. So you can use this feature without worrying about uh, browser compatibility. So uh, this goes deeper into how these strings work. You can even create multi-line strings, which is cool. Um, and if you want to check out this guide, this guide's more of like a tutorial. It's kind of geared towards advanced use, and especially near the end. But it has a good intro to it in the beginning. So uh, you can check it out. The other good thing about the template of strings is that it will automatically you know, encode your values for you. OK, let's move on. Well, maybe I just misspoke there. I'm thinking of JSX. So it won't encode your values for you. It'll just put the string directly in there. Let's just ignore what I said there. And you can read these guides. They'll be better than what I just said. OK. So that's the end of the .env section. If you have any questions about that, let me know. Next, we're going to move on to responsive web design. Now, this course isn't going to dive deep into actual web page design. There's another course uh, in the graphics, computer graphics department that talks about web design. but it is important to know how web design works uh, to understand how to build web pages based on web design. So let's check this out. So responsive web design means building your website in such a way that it would look good on a desktop computer, it would look good on phones, tablets, phablets, or you know, if game consoles now have browsers in them, so you have to worry about you know TVs. You know, full HD TVs, 4K TVs. You have to worry about, uh, you know, even like a 3DS, I believe, has a browser on it. So you have to worry about that kind of browser. So all these different screens have different sizes and a different number of pixels per inch, also known as DPI dots per inch. So by controlling the viewport and the grids, talk about in a minute, you can make a site that would look good on any of these screen sizes. So in a web page, you can set what is known as a viewport. And this is the, the visible area of the web page. <clears throat> so in the past, you know, you, you didn't really specify viewport because there were, you're only viewing the web on uh, generally desktop computers. But now smartphones make it so that, you know, you have a lot of pixels crammed into a smaller screen. Uh, especially with, you know, when you get into the iPhones, they have the retina screens and, you know, uh, where there's like twice the number of pixels in an inch. So to combat this, we need to scale the pixels in uh, that we're specifying in CSS to match what uh, a device-independent pixel would be on the device. So what's a device-independent pixel? Uh, so each screen knows how big it is and it knows how many pixels there are in the uh, in, a, in an inch and using that information it can determine how many pixels how many actual little red blue green tiny dots on the screen could be combined together to make what would be one basically reasonable pixel on uh, across any device <clears throat> now each device may have a slightly different definition of how big that pixel is, you know, based on Android versus iOS. But you can get a really good approximation by using this tag inside of your head um, in your JavaScript, or sorry, in your HTML. So if you read this, 
Uh, let's look. So if you view without the viewport meta tag, then each pixel. Uh, sorry, let me jump in here. Each pixel will uh, basically map to an, an actual pixel on the device. So let's say you have a, well, let's actually, let's pull up an example. So if I press Command Alt I or Control Alt I, I can pull up this con de uh, developer console. If I click this button right here, I can open up a device toolbar and I can resize uh, my window inside of my browser window. That's because I have it set to responsive, but I could set this to a phone as well. And we see an iPhone 5 has 320 pixels by 568 pixels. So that's 320 pixels wide by 568 pixels tall. Uh, but those are device independent pixels. You know, it actually has you know three times that number of pixels. So this image here, which had a size of, you know, let's check it out, inspect it, has a width of 460 pixels. So uh, actual pixels mapped to the you know actual device pixels. So there be 960 actual pixels. This this width is half of what the actual pixels are. Now, if we scaled using the viewport tag, we'll get a, a different outcome. So if you see right here, it's already showing a preview of it. Then press Command Alt I again. You know, you can also access that developer tools by going to more tools, developer tools. Uh, this is not enabled by default, but I believe I told you how to do that in earlier classes. But uh, you just go into your settings and enable the developer tools. Now look at this image is spanning the entire width of the screen. So the only difference is that we added that viewport tag to the header. Uh, but we see this image, you know, has a width of 460, a height of 345. And it doesn't extend past the screen because we have a max width on the image of 100%. If we turn that off, you see it would extend even past the screen. So we'd have to scroll left to right. So by adding this max width 100%, it makes sure that the image does not extend past the edge of the screen. And we have that over here as well. You know, this image, well, this image actually doesn't have that width, max width. At any rate, you can see that the image is bigger and the text is slightly bigger as well. So it's more readable. So in our Create React app, we actually have that already built in. So if we go to our index.html inside the public, we can see it already has a meta name viewport content equals width, device width, initial scale equals one, and it has this uh, shrink to fit equals no. So that's the first part of responsive web design is, is setting this viewport. If you just set this viewport on any old site, you know, the site's probably not gonna look good still. So there are more things you need to do, uh, such as only using relative sizes for your, uh, images and columns and your you know, sections. So that's using you know percentages and EM values for width instead of using actual pixel uh, values. We'll go over that as we go along. But when you go to lay out your, uh, your actual website, the, the prevailing way to do it these days is to use a grid. So this grid view, it divides the page up into columns. So these lines won't exist on your page, but uh, in the CSS, the concept of these lines will exist. So it's very helpful when designing web pages to make it so you're not using pixel values, but you're using, you know, how many columns do you want an element to span? So for instance, this header 
is spanning all 12 columns. So this purple header spans all 12. Then we have this right section that spans exactly three columns. And then this left section, which spans exactly three columns as well, and it has some elements stacked on top of each other. And then we have this footer that spans uh, 12 columns down here. And generally our content would be inside of here and it would span one, two, three, four, five, six columns. So this is a typical layout or possible layout for a web page. So we can check out this example. And if we resize it, we can use the responsive. So we can resize it at will. We see that the grid, the columns shrink and these elements shrink as well, but they always take up three, uh, three columns, regardless of how narrow the grid is. So generally, or uh, typically, that grid will have 12 columns. There are systems that you know, can specify a different number of columns, but 12 has been the generally agreed upon standard. Uh, it's not, you know, a hard standard, but you can think of it as 12 columns. So, you know, if something takes three columns, then it's going to take up a quarter of the screen. So let's stick with grids for a second. Uh, Let's jump back over here. So if we take here specifically grid views, uh, there's examples of how to build the grid views here using float left and specifying the width of uh, each type of column span you would do. So if you only want to span one column, then it would be 8.33% of the width of the page. So 8.33 is 1 12th of 100. If you wanted to span two columns, then it would be 16.66, which is twice the value of column one. Uh, if you want to span three columns, that'd be a quarter of the screen or 25% and so on and so forth, all the way to uh, spanning completely 12 columns. So you would use that like this, each column you would specify how many columns it should span in each section. So this column three would span 25% of the page and column nine class would span 75% of the page. Now setting all this up yourself uh, is possible. You know, you could even copy and paste all this in, but there's a lot of uh, CSS frameworks that do all this for you and provide some more features. So we're going to go over that in a second, how to do this all with CSS frameworks. Another part of responsive web design that we'll get to at a later time are uh, media queries. So these will let you hide and show elements based on the screen size. You can even you could change the CSS completely based on the screen size or the browser size or the window size. So you can see here, you know, the desktop version could have this right section and left section. Uh, but then when you switch to phone, you know, that left section could be at the top instead. And then you have the content in the middle vertically instead of horizontally. And then you have the right section at the bottom. Also go to images later, um, but now we're going to jump right into frameworks. But first, uh, if you want more resources on responsive web design, I recommend reading into these. This is another developers.google.com. This is an actual uh, tutorial on how to build this weather app where you know, as you resize the screen, it will switch from a vertical list to a horizontal list if you have enough space. It also goes more into how to, you know, use relative widths and 
like jumps in the media queries as well. It goes more into depth of how this all works. And another resource on that same site, you know, it's actually the sec next section, are common patterns you would see in uh, responsive web design. So these are kind of like templates you can use to build your site. I recommend checking out these two, playing around with their examples, you know, trying to build something yourself. Uh, you know, there's no responsive web design in Project Part 3, but there will be in Project Part 4, so start getting familiar with it. So now we're going to look into CSS frameworks. So CSS frameworks provide a bunch of uh, CSS classes that you can use out of the box. Uh, a lot of them will provide some combination of CSS and or JavaScript. Um, and they, they provide the responsive capabilities. They use the mobile first paradigm. They, uh, and they have a lot of cross browser compatibility. So they do a lot of the, the, that boilerplate code you need to do to support multiple browser windows. Like, uh, you know, some of the CSS features, uh, require that dash web kit in front of it or, or dash whatever in front of it because they're in quotes experimental uh, the CSS frameworks will abstract that all away for you uh, and provide a more easy to use interface with these uh, concepts so usually free and they're usually easy to use some of them are harder than others uh, but we'll jump into that and another benefit to CSS frameworks is that there are usually templates you can use to design your site. So you, if you're not a good designer, you can just pull out this template and see how they built it, and then you know uh, adapt that template to your site. So one framework, for example, is Bootstrap. This is the most popular uh, CSS framework that currently exists. We check out what Bootstrap provides. All right, we can see all these websites built with Bootstrap. Uh, Bootstrap was produced by Twitter. We can see that Bootstrap provides a grid system. So it uses 12 columns, and it, uh, it's based on how the viewport size currently is. So the viewport is the browser window. It uses media queries. Uh, there's grid options. And it has a bunch of built-in ways to specify how many columns there should be based on the current screen size. So this call medium one means that this column uh, would exist as a column on medium screens or bigger. It's pretty complicated at first, you're getting used to it, but Bootstrap also provides uh, components. So not only do you get that responsive grid, but you can get you know, actual drop down menus, drop up menus, all kinds of options on all these. It provides button groups. So look, you can have these buttons that you know you're probably familiar with button toolbar, you know, labels, it has these, you know, the new label, and you can add, you can make a green background just by saying success, all kinds of cool stuff you can build with Bootstrap. All stuff that you're probably familiar with because a lot of students use Bootstrap to display their content. But the problem with Bootstrap is that it's using uh, a good amount of JavaScript, including jQuery. And jQuery and React can work together, but it's not really recommended because if you do it wrong, uh, 
then that jQuery can actually slow down your page because uh, as elements get rendered, they could end up uh, firing off jQuery JavaScript, which would manipulate the DOM after it's been rendered. So every time it's rendered, would need to fire again. And we know from React, you know, every time a value changes, it could re-render the components. And when that happens, uh, so frequently, you know, manipulating the DOM with jQuery uh, could be really taxing on slower systems. So Bootstrap, I recommend staying away from it when you're using React. But if you do it properly, you can use uh, Bootstrap with React. And the idea is you just wouldn't use some of these, uh, some of the JavaScript components that Bootstrap provides. So another, on the other end of the spectrum, you know, Bootstrap is pretty bloated. There's a framework called Pure CSS. Pure CSS is produced by Yahoo. So instead of Twitter, just have Yahoo. Uh, it's a very bare bones framework, but it is, you know, that's a, a benefit and a, a con. The benefit is that it'll take a lot less time to download this resource so the user can you know, view your page more quickly. But the drawback is you don't get a lot out of the box from pure CSS. So you still have to build um, a lot of your components out. So you saw we had all those labels and, and wells and stuff in Bootstrap. In pure CSS, we would need to rebuild those, which is fine. Uh, it just depends on the size of your project and what your goal is. So Pure CSS has a grid system where uh, you would specify a pure grid, and then you would specify that uh, column should take up one out of three, uh, one third of the screen here. And in pure, they use you know five column layout and a twenty four column layout. So they don't even use the twelve column layout per se in here. Although you can fake it uh, just by using these twenty four column layouts. You know, it's just twice the size. You know, pure does provide form fields just like uh, Bootstrap, but they're you know, they're not as styled. You still have to style them. Those have buttons and menus, tables. You see it's very, you know, it's a lot more Spartan than the Bootstrap version. So what we're going to use in this class is Balma. Now Balma, the problem with Balma, is that it's not even in version one yet. It's in version 0.4.3. But Balma is, is, uh, provides a fresh look on the whole grid system. And I feel like it's easier to use and, and it's more descriptive in, with its CSS. So we saw on Pure, you know, the grid looked like this. It was pure u dash u dash one dash three. In Bootstrap, uh, the grid looks like this. Call md dash one, you know, call dash xs dash six, you know, extra small screens. It can get kind of intimidating. So to, to make it easier, uh, to use the grid system, we're going to use Balma, which looks like this with the grid. So each column, we'd have columns to contain all the columns, and then each column would just be a class column. And then Balma's smart enough to uh, give each of those columns equal width. So however many columns you have, is it will determine how, how much width each column will have. And then you can even, you know, change the size of a particular column by adding 
these modifiers. So is three quarters, is two thirds, is half, is one third, is one quarter. So in Bama, you'll see a lot of this is dash uh, to modify the uh, CSS. So let's actually check a demo of this out. So this is not specific to React. Oh, and another good thing about Balma, which is uh, the same as pure CSS, is that this solution doesn't have any JavaScript in it. So without JavaScript, it's not manipulating the DOM after it's been rendered by React. It's just using CSS to, uh, to position the elements, to style the elements. So with that solution, we can have more confidence that we're not going to screw things up to the point where you know some JavaScript is is being executed with every render. So using Balma with React pairs well together. You know, just keeping it pure CSS. Oh, sorry. When I say pure CSS, <laughs> so there is the pure CSS framework. But when I say pure CSS, I just mean it, it's it, there's no JavaScript involved with this uh, with Balma. So let's check out this demo. So this is the same demo uh, from their site right here, right here where you can play with it. So I have a header here, uh, which just has some CSS that centers the text and adds some padding around the element, around the text. But then that, I have no other CSS in there. Everything else is going to be provided from the Balma framework. Sorry, CSS. So I've included a, an external style sheet into my code pen that loads up Balma. And I see the first column. So the first thing we need to do to specify that we want to you know, have columns is to have a container div that has the class columns. Then inside of that div, we can break that up into columns by having each div with a column. Now, if we have a div in here without the column, it's not going to be a column. So you see that kind of messes things up. It's getting uh, cut off on the left side here. So generally, any child inside of columns should have the class column. You see our, our columns all shrank in, in width because I added a fifth column. Now if we delete that, uh, we could delete the first column as well. And we can see now the the three columns span the entire width. So each of them are a third of the uh, page. Now, the second column, I added a, a second paragraph tag. Uh, I could add paragraph tags within. I have as many elements as I want inside this second column, and they will just stay with inside the second column as long as I keep them at 100% width. The third column has even more text in it, just to show you. Each of these columns can have a different height, ultimately. And then the fourth column has nothing else in it, just the fourth column. And to get these headers, I'm using some more Balma uh, components. So there's the notification class, and you can put these modifiers on them to change the background color. So the is warning would be a yellow background, is danger will be the red background, and is info will just be the blue background. And then the other column that I had in here was is success. Bring that one back in. The green column would be is success. So you see, this is pretty straightforward. So, uh, but if we want to modify the, um, the width of each column, so let's make the first column span half the screen, 
we would use these modifiers right here, these size modifiers. So we just add the is half to the column. First column is half. Now the first column takes up half the screen and the remaining three columns take up the remaining space. Let's say we add is quarter to this. We see a second column is not actually changing size. So it's not is quarter, it's is one quarter. So let's add is one quarter. There we go. So this second column now takes up 25% of the space. First column takes up 50% of the space. So the remaining 25% is split up by these two columns here. Now what if we added is one quarter to the third column. Now we see the third column will be a quarter of the screen, but then in order to get to the fourth column, uh, it doesn't even look like the fourth column is showing up anymore. So the fourth column just got cut off on the right side. So if we're overflowing our page horizontally uh, using this grid system, then we won't see uh, anything that overflows. So even if we do is half here, you know, a half plus a quarter plus a half equals more than one. So anything that uh, scrolls horizontally is going to get cut off. We could add some CSS in there to allow the scrolling. But, you know, this is just bad design. <laughs> we shouldn't have columns that are, shouldn't add up more than one with all these you know, modifiers. So that's up to you to keep that CSS in check with that. So if you want to use a grid system uh, using something similar to what uh, we saw where, you know, the elements would span three columns on the left and right, we can use the is modifier with a number to specify how many columns that that particular column should, uh, how many grid columns that column should span across. So this is based on a 12 column layout. So if you say is two, then it would span two, one sixth of the screen or do two out of 12 of the columns. So let's apply that here. So let's say we wanted to have the third or the first column to be three columns and the last one to be three as well. So that's how it already is working. So let's add a second, let's add a fifth column inside of here. Let's actually, let's get rid of third column to, to make it more like what we saw, the example where we had the left and right side and then the content in the middle. Get rid of this is one quarter and you know, this will be our content in the middle. Our left side, you know, we could have multiple things stacked up here, just like that example. And we could have uh, on the right side, we could add more text here to make it span. Add some text here. We could expand the width. All right, expand the height. Or we can just do the padding, actually. Now we get something similar to what we saw in uh, the first example, where 
first column spanned three columns, the last column spanned three columns as well, and then we had content in the middle. So you see quickly we made a site that's resembling what we commonly see on the on the web. And uh, Bulma will add a little gap here. There's a little gutter, so you don't have to worry about that spacing. Uh, if you don't like that gap there, then you can use this. Uh, where is it? All the way down here. So you can add this is gapless to the columns. And we see it smushes them together, so there's no gap. So if you wanted to control the gap a little better, you could just add that is capless. There's some other options in here as well. You can do multi-line. Uh, and we see right here, by default, columns are only activated from tablet onwards. So at what's considered a tablet screen or bigger, then we'd have columns. But uh, when we're on a mobile device, those divs will actually get stacked vertically instead. So let's let's see how that works. So if you wanted to force it to be mobile, uh, show up as columns on mobile, you'd add an is mobile modifier to the columns that are just like is gapless. So let's see, now we're on a different part of the site. Let's jump back down to where I wanted to see it. You can see all these columns are getting stacked up on top of each other. Uh, when we have the is mobile modifier, then we see there's four columns still because we have columns is mobile. But if we didn't have uh, the is mobile, then the columns would get stacked up uh, vertically. So there's one, two, three, four. If we expand this out, you can see it on the desktop, it's going horizontally. But we shrink it down to a mobile size and it is uh, stacking vertically. So this makes it easier for the mobile user to read, and it's a more natural experience of scrolling up and down. It's great in CodePen. You know, this, this ball mode, it's not dependent on React at all. You can use it in regular HTML. Uh, but how do you use it in React? So let's let's do that. So like I said, in the beginning of this class, I set up this fresh project for you. Uh, I just muddied it with some process.env. We're going to get rid of all that so you can see how we use React. So I'm going to set up a, a separate terminal window here. And I'm going to install uh, Balma. So on Balma's directions, you know, it says to do, go to the beginning, npm install Balma. But we're using Yarn, which is uh, an extension of npm. And with Yarn, we would do Yarn add Balma. Whenever you see npm install, just replace that uh, in your command line with Yarn add. So it'll take a couple seconds to link up, and now it's, it's in. So now we need to import uh, the Balma CSS directly into our project, just like we imported app CSS here. We do that like this. We do import Balma slash uh, If we try to import Balma, it's not going to work. Unfortunately, we have to import the CSS file inside of the Balma package. So if we check out known mod modules and go into Balma, we see a CSS and we see a SAS. Uh, SAS is uh, something that we're not working with right now, but it's a uh, CSS preprocessor that we'll, we'll get into a, a little bit uh, by the end of this class. So anyway, we need to import the CSS version. So we're going to do Balma slash CSS slash Balma dot CSS. Need that as our full import statement. Zoom in a little bit. That's very important. So don't just import Balma. You got to import Balma slash CSS uh, slash Balma dot CSS.
I'm going to go ahead and delete everything inside here. Oh, I'll, get, I'll replace it in a second. So we're going to copy this example we wrote here into React. Now we can't just do a straight copy into JSX because uh, in JSX, we're expecting class name instead of class. And that's the primary difference here. So we could change all these classes to class name. Uh, but Or we could use the uh, HTML to JSX converter. React Magic one again is one of the best. Uh, get rid of this create class. We're, we already have the class created, so we don't need to create the class. We just want the guts. And this will replace all the classes with class name, and it'll wrap everything inside a parent div. So we just go ahead and copy all of this and bring it into our app. So replace our return value here. Now to keep things clean, we're also going to remove everything from our app CSS. And we can re remove this logo just because it's gray. And I got our page now. So this is our React app. It's been running the whole time. I never stopped it. Um, so Yarn or Yarn Start was able to pick up our changes automatically, and we got our site in here. Now you may notice there's this little bug over here where it's scrolling inside of our you know page. To get over that bug, to our index.css, we're going to modify our body. So in here, we're going to add a height, auto, and overfly, overflow y, not, or sorry, overflow y hidden. We save that, and it gets rid of that inner scroll bar. That's just a bug with. Uh, Balma, I believe. Um, certain browsers will show that scroll bar. Some others won't. But if we add this you know, fix to index.css, uh, it'll fix that little scroll bar. So that's another thing you need to remember in addition to the import is that you should add these to your uh, body. And since uh, create React app already has the body element being modified inside of index.css. You know, adding the height auto overflow y hidden to the index.css is the best place for it in create React app. All right, so last thing to match what I had in the example, we need to add that header adding. And I'm going to center the text. I save that, and we'll see it updates automatically in here. So that's how you include Balma inside of a React project. I see this URL is not being used anymore. And now, last but not least, let's see. We have some notes on there. So to use Bulma in React, you would use yarn add Bulma, and then you would import Bulma CSS slash Bulma.css, and then you would add to the body style in, in index.css the height auto overfly, overflow y hidden. I keep on saying overfly, overflow y hidden. And this is just uh, an extra copy. That is a mistake. I need to move, move this link. But this is the, the CSS demo again. So that's pretty much it. The, so we'll be using Balma in part four of the project. You don't need to worry about it for part three. Uh, but you can start playing with it, figuring it out. And uh, in particular, we'll be using the grid system. 
but one last thing I want to show you is that Balm is not just the grid system. If you look through the docs, you can see there are elements and components as well. So this element, you can create a box that looks like this that has the shading. You can create a button that, uh, you know, there's all kinds of buttons you can do here. You can specify content. Uh, you can do forms, delete, crosses. Uh, if you want to use the icons that are provided with uh, Font Awesome, then you can include those as well. Which we'll, we'll talk about Font Awesome another day. And uh, it does some images, tables, tags, titles, all this stuff. I recommend going through and looking yourself at all the possibilities you can have with Palma. Now, it, all these things look very interactive, but Palma is not going to provide that interactivity. It just provides the styling. So you still have to provide the interactivity. So for instance, when they click on Balma as the first breadcrumb, you would need to have something in there that actually hooks into your uh, your state or whatever, however you're controlling the uh, with it. This particular thing would be the React Router probably. When you click on that, then it would uh, fire up the right path in React Router. So instead of using A, you could use link to you know home page there. Uh, so these breadcrumbs are pretty cool. You know, what else is in here? Modal windows. You can launch a modal window and it'll be this. You could show some ads here <laughs> or something or, or, you know, these modal windows get pretty crazy. So you see this modal card down here that can have scroll bar inside of it. You can have buttons down here. And you can close it right here. All that interactivity you just saw with that closing and opening, that's all JavaScript. Uh, that would be handled in React. But uh, but all the styling of, you know, graying out the back here, you know, and providing these scroll bars here and this header and this footer, mm -hmm. that's all provided by Balma. Mm -hmm. So, yep, check this out. We'll be using these components. We'll be digging more into these components in a later class. Uh, so the most important thing to check out for now is to understand this grid system. You know, if you want to get really experiment, experimental, you can check out the tiles uh, to give you more like a Pinterest look. But uh, we're not going to the tiles quite yet. They involve a lot of nesting, which can get uh, a little bit brain bendy. So all right, hit me up on Slack if you have any questions. Uh, you know, set up your project part two. Uh, sorry, product part three. It's going to be due on this Friday. And make sure that when you check it in, you don't also check in your .env file. Don't check in your .env file. I'll just use my .env file to run your projects. So uh, don't send me your API key. Um, just have a placeholder for it inside of your uh, your JavaScript using the process.env. All right, again, if you have any questions, hit me up on Slack. Uh, if you if you want, if you have any feedback about how I'm presenting the class, please let me know. <laughs> I'll, I'll do my best to accommodate. However, uh, I'm losing any of you, or if I'm going too slowly, just let me know how you feel. All right, thanks. I'll see you all next uh, time.